But for right now, uh, let's go to the Middle East, because images have emerged appearing to show Israeli forces preparing to flood the labyrinth of tunnels used by Hamas under the Gaza Strip with seawater. Israel is said to have completed installing at least five pumps about a mile north uh, of the Al-Shati refugee camp that could move thousands of cubic metres of water per hour, meaning they could flood the 300-mile network of tunnels within weeks. To discuss this, I'm joined by Professor of Politics at the University of Buckingham, Eric Kaufman. Eric, good to see you. Thanks good very much you, indeed. Um, the big worry, I suppose, for this plan, which, which is pretty um, elaborate and, and, and pretty complicated, I suppose, is it really depends on what's in the tunnels. And some people think maybe some of the hostages might be in the tunnels. Well, um, if, certainly if you're Hamas, that's probably the card you want to try and right. play to uh, prevent uh, the IDF from doing that. Yeah. Um, I presume brains much much sharper than, than, I, than mine who, who have thought about this stuff have figured out that might be an effective way to put these tunnels out of action. Of course, this is one of the reasons for the invasion is, be, is to sort of disarm or mm. to, to remove the effectiveness of this uh, network, which helps Hamas to attack Israel. Yes, exactly right. And it also helps them to hide all sorts of things and, and store all kinds of things as well. Because I was talking to someone the other day who said that there's a belief amongst Israeli intelligence that actually there is a, a, a network of tunnels which is about 300 miles long, but there might be a further network one level below the tunnels that they know about. Wow. Uh, but, well, it just, I, I mean, in a way, this sort of gets to this narrative of the idea that Hamas has been building up mm. this infrastructure, has been using aid money and other funds, channeling it towards creating a, yeah, I mean, a sort of network that would allow them to attack Israel. And mm. so this, uh, this should prompt a rethink about uh, exactly what, what we're doing uh, in Gaza, mm. what the end game is, and, and really you know, what kind of an honest broker we're dealing with. Yes, exactly. Because, I mean, the problem as well for Israel is that it's a very tough thing to do to break up a terrorist network because, you know, one of the things that's said politically by many um, Israeli government officials, and Piers Morgan had the Israeli ambassador in this evening, um, is that, you know, they know that there's an awful lot of people in, in Palestine, whether it's in the West Bank or in Gaza, who are pretty, uh, shall we say, sympathetic to the Hamas cause, you know, and it's not simply that they all hate Hamas and they'd like to see the, 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 the Israelis get rid of them. Many people there actually are rather happy that Hamas are there. Um, and they're not suddenly going to just think differently if Hamas are supposedly destroyed. Well, that's right. I mean, this is the dilemma. Yes, you're right, because if you look at the opinion, the surveys that I've seen of the Gaza population would show sort of 70, mm. 70 80 percent support right. uh, for Hamas and its actions. Uh, so, yeah, there is a lot of popular support. Um, it's always a tricky thing, you know, do, if you attack terrorists and you have uh, casualties, does that actually sort of create new recruits? Mm. Or is it a small cell, self-contained, which can be defeated? Right. We've seen examples, you know, in the Middle East, Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia was defeated as a network uh, and smashed militarily. But in other cases, Afghanistan and Iraq, we've seen that this hasn't worked. Right. And so it's just... I think it's unrealistic to expect that support for this is going to somehow d dry up just because Israel takes out the network. Uh, I guess a lot of it will depend on how self-contained that network is. Is it just like the IRA, for example, you had provisional IRA mm. families, it was a tight network, you could actually try and get those people arrested and, and shut it down. Right. But in a situation where it's very fluid and people are moving into and out of Hamas, that's much harder. It is. And I mean, the thing with the IRA was, was that in the end, it was resolved politically no matter what happened. I mean, there were plenty of um, people who would tell you there were British Army death squads and that there was, you know, the shoot, to, the shoot to kill policies and all of that. But none of that actually won the war, if you want to call it that. It was not until they sat down uh, with Sinn Féin, as it were, uh, that the IRA sort of finally gave up. Yeah, and I think it, it also, I mean, there was a political wing, uh, you know, Sinn Féin, which yeah. when the IRA did bombing and shooting, Sinn Féin's poll numbers dropped. Right. Eventually, that meant that the political wing, the demo democratic mm. wing, was able to pressure the military wing not to be so belligerent. Yeah. I don't know if that relationship exists because there's no democracy. In there's Gaza. no Hamas political wing, is there? They don't need to win an election. Right. They've got power for life. And right. so, you know, if they conduct raids and it hits their poll ratings, which I'm not sure it would, mm. but we don't even know whether that's possible because it's not a democracy. Whereas in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, you had elections and that could provide some kind of discipline to keep the violence in yeah. check. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? Because some of the um, uh, scenes that we've witnessed around the world, whether they're in American universities or whether they're in um, the streets of London, 
you know, there's an awful lot of pro-Palestinian um, enthusiasm, shall we say, out there, and much of it does cross over into some of the things Hamas have done. You know, not all of it is peaceful. Not all of it is, you know, let's have some kind of two-state solution. Quite a lot of it uh, is pretty awful. Well, yeah, I mean, of course, you've got a mixture of your uh, progressive left, radical mm. left elements with more Islamist elements yeah. or, or pro-Arab elements coming together, uh, at least in Western settings. You see that, I mean, I don't know if you, you saw the uh, hearing, the congressional hearings with- Yes, uh, with well, the... I'm hoping that we're gonna play a couple of those. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, we'll come to that. But there's also one piece of, uh, of film of uh, uh, a student at NYU who's Jewish talking about uh, their experience. Have a look at this. Being a Jew at NYU is walking to class and passing torn and defaced posters of innocent hostages with the words occupier and murderer written across their faces. Being a Jew at NYU is being surrounded by students and faculty who support the murder and kidnapping of Jews because after all, as they say, resistance is justified when people are occupied. It is being surrounded by social justice warriors and self-proclaimed feminists whose calls for justice end abruptly when the rape victims are Jews. Being a Jew at NYU has meant being physically assaulted in NYU's library by a fellow student while I was wearing an American Israeli flag and having my attacker still roam freely throughout the campus. I mean, that is an, inc an incredible statement because I um, lived in New York for nearly 10 years. I got married in New York. I know New York really well. And New York to me was a sort of a bit of an outpost of, of Israel. You know, I, <laughs> I, I used to say to people, you know, well, I lived in New York for 10 years, so I consider myself to be an honorary Jew. You know, right. I also was brought up in North London. You know, but to see New York changing to that extent where it's now actually a positive disadvantage and it may even be dangerous to declare yourself to be Jewish, it's extraordinary. Well, yeah, I mean, there are the demographic changes. So there are, as a percentage now, Muslims have surpassed right. Jews in the United States. So that's one thing right. that's going on. But of course, the other thing is is this, again, this, this marriage of the radical left, um, which is a largely white yeah. uh, creature, and Islamist sentiment. Mm. Um, and so, so what you have is people who have been weaned on critical race theory on this idea right. of uh, colonial white settlers against oppressed colonized mm. minorities. Mm. Taking that uh, outlook, which is from the United States case of white settlers and indigenous uh, colonized people and, and co copying and pasting that onto this very complicated yeah. multi-layered conflict and saying, well, the Jews are the white settlers and the people of right. color who are being colonized are called the Palestinians, so we've got to right. attack the colonizer. Right. And that's the mentality that you find. Um, and, and again, the reason, some of the reason this is metastasized is because uh, the professoriate has become so dominant, so tilted. Yeah. It's gone from sort of three to one left to right in the social sciences in the United States in the 60s to about 12, 13 to one today. Right. Once you get a monoculture like that, the incentives are for people who exemplify the values of the community, so who are fundamentalist about those progressive left values. And so that's why we're, mm. I think, one of the underrated stories here is that monoculture is incubating yes. this radicalism. And I wonder if we just haven't been paying attention, but have a look, you spoke about this um, ridiculous reaction from some of the Ivy League um, school bosses when they were being questioned at a congressional committee. Dr. Kornbluth, yes. does M at MIT, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate MIT's code of conduct or rules regarding bullying and harassment, yes or no? If targeted at individuals not making public statements. Ms. McGill, at Penn, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct, yes or no? If the speech turns into conduct, it can be harassment. And Dr. Gay, at Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. Just unbelievable stuff. Um, Eric, thank you very much indeed. I mean, we're unfortunately, we're out of time, but I'm sure we'll have you back.